it's interesting in the in the Arab world, you know, my my most recent visit, um, uh, how isolated Gaddafi is. I mean, it's like no other leader. Uh, I you know we, we, we have witnessed in any time in in the past several decades. Uh, um, people in every corner of the Arab world are really sympathetic with the Libyan people against the Gaddafi regime. We've seen the isolation internationally, so much so that it has in some ways changed uh, the public attitudes on international intervention. Arabs, by and large, are fiercely anti-imperialistic, and they are worried about Western intervention, and they don't trust the West, and they haven't trusted the United States, and polls show that. And so in some ways, they don't want the U.S. to intervene, even against awful regimes, as happened in the case of Iraq and Saddam Hussein. Um, and yet, in this particular case, there is surprisingly receptivity in the Arab public for an American intervention to stop Gaddafi. So we have really an unusual opportunity in some ways. And, but obviously on the American side, while the sympathy is with the, with the public, uh, everybody would like to see the Gaddafi regime in some ways collapse more quickly and spare a lot of lives. The problem, of course, is far more complicated. People can invite you to come in today, but once you're at war, you're at war. And if it takes longer uh, and, and attitudes change, uh, you obviously pay the price. So the U.S. has to do this carefully. Uh, it cannot be done as a unilateral action if the U.S. intervenes in any shape or form. Uh, it, there has to be a very um, it, uh, legalistic uh, logic to the intervention, uh, hopefully international, hopefully uh, through the U.N., um, obviously, in cases of genocide, one can find an, an, an opening for that in international law. Uh, but it, it remains unclear, obviously, whether, in fact, uh, there will be a mood to intervene, whether somebody else can do it other than the U.S., whether the U.S. is prepared to do it. It is clear that the revolutions in, in Tunisia and Egypt have not been uh, in the first place, either about the U.S. or about Israel. That's clear. People want change. They want freedom. They want dignity. But once they manifest their opinion in a political process, you know they're very angry with Israel, and you know they're very angry with American foreign policy over the Israel-Palestine question. So that's going to put a lot of pressure on the administration, that any new uh, policy that is going to be announced, even toward revolutions in the Middle East, uh, is going to need to have a component on a vision of a comprehensive Arab-Israeli peace, because that is something that the public expects, the public demands, the public sees as uh, an, an issue of credibility for, for the U.S. Uh, number two, in the short term, it is clear that the prospects of an Israeli-Palestinian agreement have actually diminished, not increased. And the reason for it is very complicated, but uh, first, the Israelis are very insecure about, quote, losing Egypt. I don't think the Israeli-Egyptian treaty is jeopardized, actually. I think the peace treaty will be in place. I think there is an understanding across uh, uh, Egyptian politics that it's a mutually beneficial agreement. But there will not be the kind of collaboration and cooperation on foreign policy uh, like the one we had saw between the Mubarak regime and the Israeli government. What we're seeing here in the, in the short term is a, a, a large numbers of the Arab people um, uh, force their way uh, into politics and change governments in ways that Al-Qaeda couldn't do it in a militant way. Uh, they're doing it peacefully, and they're doing it non-ideologically. And if they succeed, as they have in Egypt so far, and in Tunisia, and probably in other places, then it sends exactly uh, the, a, a, the message that al-Qaeda's method isn't the successful one. It is bin Laden's nightmare. For that reason, American foreign policy has to invest in the success of peaceful Arab revolutions. Because if that success turns into failure if, in fact, these newly empowered people who are basically the new generation of Arabs 
who are the vast majority of Arabs, if you look at the demographics. Um, if uh, they cannot have the voice heard through peaceful means, you know that that energy is going to be channeled, channeled into something else. And it, if, if they don't succeed, it becomes America's nightmare. It becomes their country's nightmare. It becomes the world's nightmare. But it also becomes America's nightmare.